Welcome back to What's New with Mead. We're on episode 25. Today I have Eric Fowler from White Labs Yeast here to um, come talk to us about uh, yeast in general and White Labs and learn some more about them. And um, I sent him a list of questions and it's going to be a good time. Eric, um, what's your what's your title at White Labs? if you don't mind me asking. Yeah, for sure. Uh, first off, thanks for having me. Episode 25, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> that's no small feat. I know how much work it takes going into these. It's as simple as it seems when you're listening to it, but the back end's a lot of work. So um, kudos for, for keeping it up this long. <laughs> uh, as you mentioned, my name's uh, Eric Fowler. I'm the Education and Brewery Experience Manager at White Labs. Uh, what that means is kind of a little bit of everything. Um, I'm fortunate that I'm, I'm in a role that uh, gets to dive into a lot of different beverage types um, mm-hmm. through a lot of different projects, whether it's um, our brewery with our, our two tasting rooms, uh, new strain releases, some of our R&D projects, our sensory program, um, and presenting um, different types of workshops and kind of creating fun content like we're doing today. Cool. That's awesome, man. How long have you been in that role? Uh, I've been with the company for I hit six years uh, this month, which is December um, 2020 of the date of our recording. Um, and you know, it's just continued to adapt. I started in our tasting room, uh, worked for a regional, uh, prominent regional brewery before, and then a small nano brewery as well. So I've definitely been on the beer side, but before coming into beer, I actually started in wine. So, oh, okay. uh, you know, mead's kind of a cool hybrid of, of the two and, um, gets categorized more as wine, especially in the, the legal side of things and in the production side of things. But I tend to see a lot of the fans tend to be beer geeks, which is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Definitely. What can you, can you give a brief description of White Labs for anybody who might not be versed in who you guys are? Sure. Yeah. We're a, a primarily a, a yeast manufacturing company. We're, we're the largest liquid yeast uh, provider in, in the world uh, for, for beer, wine, spirits, uh, mead, kombucha. And we've been around for 25 years. So this was actually our 25th anniversary, 2020. And it was supposed to be a pretty awesome year. And, you know, um, we still had a great year, but there were a lot of setbacks for obvious yeah. reasons. But, uh, you know, beside from still launching a bunch of new different yeast strains that are pretty rad, uh, you know, we've still been able to, to keep pushing forward and keep supplying um, worldwide uh, fermentation enthusiasts for mm-hmm. the home brewers, which is probably who's a lot listening today or the pro brewers. Uh, we're located in San Diego, California is our headquarters where I'm calling in today. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we have a production facility in brew pub in Asheville, North Carolina, and then a production facility in Copenhagen as well. Very cool. That's awesome. Okay. So I want to ask a couple things about you as a home brewer or a brewer in general. Um, Are are you home brewing on the side? Do you do anything or do a lot, do a lot of brewing in your free? Yeah, it's, it's funny. It changes. Um, Mm -hmm. The, you know, the last nine months uh, have has increased my homebrewing quite a bit. Really? And, you know, that, that passion's kind of been sparked up again, which is interesting. And I think a lot of it's due to not visiting as many uh, breweries or meaderies as previous years. Uh, spending a lot more time at home, you know, not mingling with as many friends and family as usual. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we've, we've got our, our small circle and I've got um, some in-laws that have started homebrewing in that time too. And it's just, it's been a blast. You know, we've probably done half a dozen batches, which is a lot considering the the previous couple of years, I hadn't done too much. Um, ciders that I do pretty. Oh, ciders. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly beer, but I'll do cider maybe once a year. Um, just out of ease of snagging some organic cider at the store and throwing some nutrient and yeast in it and calling Uh it a day. And so you said you started with wine doing more wine esque things, right? Mm-hmm. Have you yeah. done much or made much wine previously? I haven't. And admittedly, I haven't really made much e- uh, mead as well. Mm-hmm. And I think the biggest hurdle of that is not so much the enjoyment for me or lack of enjoyment because the beverages that I like a lot, it's just the the, hur- the price point, the hurdle. Yeah. Uh, I'm always afraid oh, it's yeah, not going to turn know. out. And, you know, you can know as much as you you can study as much as you want about a beverage and how to produce it, the history, how it should taste, different styles, but that the execution's um, something that takes a lot of time and there's a learning curve there. Yeah. And I've never wanted to, you know, apply that hundred dollars and uh, producing something that maybe doesn't taste that great. 
Yeah, it's funny. Um, I started making mead because I didn't want to buy the equipment. I was like, man, that's too pricey to buy equipment for beer. And then I got into mead and I was like, well, oh, crap, now I have to spend so much money on, on honey. I didn't um, really think about that expense, but uh, I definitely found I'm glad I went down this road. I love beer too. I make some beers on the side, um, but mostly meat at this point. Um, so you, you like to homebrew some and you um, last nine months, I feel like a lot of um, homebrewing has popped up more because of COVID and because of being at home, like you said, not being able to go out and try a beer, you kind of want to make your own. And it's, uh, yeah, definitely. So um, that kind of leads me to my next question. Uh, how has working at white labs, how has that, um, changed your, uh, you know, brewing process? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I, you know, I think it's just a, a maturity thing of, you know, being around products for mm-hmm. just over 10 years now. Um, homebrewing was something that I got into before really trying a lot of beer, right? It has that story of, uh, being in school and I took a fruit punch and realized I could throw some yeast in it, not knowing that there's preservatives in there that really inhibit <laughs> yeah. uh, a complete fermentation, but there's probably a percent or two of alcohol yeah. in there, but more, That's enough. yeah. Yeah. More importantly, it was fizzy and I thought it was cool. Right. It was like, wow, this is really easy to do. Um, you know, stepped up as the years went on and started producing beer on a, on a larger scale, some extract stuff, and then in return, all grain. And, I've always been a, you know, again, do what I say, not as I do. Um, I've kind of had that approach because (laughs) I get very excited and, you know, it's like, wow, there's an extra ounce of hops in here. Why am I only using one ounce when the bag's two ounces? Let me Uh throw that extra ounce in there. I was never satisfied with a lot of my beers, Um, you know, holding myself to a pretty high standard, knowing how to define a world-class beer, wine, spirit, mead you know, I just could never get to that point. And I eventually kind of gave up and stopped brewing as much. But the last year, having a little bit more space at home, um, like moving into a, a bigger house, having a garage that I could, you know, make a mess in where previously was a lot of apartment brewing, which is a lot of limitations there. Um, you know, being able to get a temperature controlled fermentation chamber you know san diego is pretty hot all the time so Mm -hmm. even in the winter like you know admittedly it it does get cold like it's you know it was in the 50s yesterday but it's it's warmer than most ideal fermentations so you really need a controlled space uh i had a a kegerator you know again about 10 years ago that i would kind of switch over and the compressor ended up dying on it never replaced it so Mm -hmm. found a good deal ended up buying it and um really monitoring my fermentations this year as opposed to what I've previously done um, and just monitoring the batches in general has made Mm -hmm. such a difference because I've been able to tweak um, anything that I don't like because I have, you know, that documentation. I have those data set of, okay, on on the gravity dropped, you know, 50% within 48, 72 hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. That looked healthy. I've been able to mitigate any issues and, be able to control that. And the beers have come out awesome. I've got a beer on tap right now. That's um, an oatmeal stout. And I, I swear it's the best beer I've ever brewed. Ooh, I love stouts. That's like I've of my beer brewing experience. I think 75% has been stouts at this point. So. Oh, awesome. So yeah. It, admittedly with this beer though, you know, there's still some uh, process tweaks that I need to do on my system. Um, you know, I shot for a seven and a half percent beer um, ended up with, you know, low gravity on those, uh, during knockout and end up with a six and a half percent beer. So, mm. you know, there is, uh, changes that I can do and there's a, a limit to how much time I can spend on really analyzing the stuff. I just like going out there and doing it right. You know, if, if I'm producing something on a professional scale, you have high standards. It needs to be consistent, but when it's at home, if it's a percent less, as long as it's not under attenuated and really sweet, I'm fine with it at the end of the day. Yeah. No, I think that um, we got to give ourselves a little grace with homebrewing too. And even, you know, you work around yeast all the time, but I think the biggest thing to remember is that yeast are creatures as well and they, they can be temperamental. And so um, that kind of, that makes me wonder of 
all the yeast you deal with, what is your, your go-to yeast for fermenting? Or do you try and pair each yeast each time? Um, I don't know. It kind of depends. Um, you know, for this, for the oatmeal stout, I used a WLP 007 dry English ale yeast, which I think is a yeast you could use in more beer styles than not. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the first couple batches I did this year before I bought the, the chest freezer with temperature control, um, I was using a lot of Kvike strains. We just mm -hmm. released a bunch of strains into our, our vaults, our specialty strain collection. Um, so I was able to get my hands on a bunch of them and really just wanted to, to play with them at home and see what these strains were all about. You know, we've used them in our, our large scale brewery, which you can see in the picture behind me. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I kind of just wanted to try in beer styles that we hadn't really been able to try in the professional scale. And had some awesome beers come out of that. Uh, but, you know, a lot of them tended to be a little fruitier than I wanted, which was fine for these big, hazy tropical IPAs. Right. But when I started brewing these like toasty ambers, it wasn't as good as it could have been with another yeast strain. Um, so, you know, I, I like the English strains. Um, I specifically, you know, like I said, dry English, but Cal L001 uh, is money as well. I mean, that, that can be used in anything. It's super easy to use. Yeah. What about um, yourself and the different meads that you make? Well, I end up, of course, we use a lot of wine yeast. I use mm -hmm. probably 85% wine yeast, but I have been recently experimenting with um, ale yeasts of different sorts and the, actually a couple of Kvike strange, uh, strains. One of my big series I love to do on my channel is called Yeast Shootout, and it's where I take mm -hmm. a mead recipe, and then I use two different yeast on them and let them ferment, and then I do, I like, announce a winner essentially which one i think fermented better within or ended up with a better result after fermentation so i, I love getting to dive into those yeast details so to speak and, and um, understand them better and I, I find it fascinating and it's fascinating to me the vast difference that a yeast can pull out of a it, really anything i mean mm -hmm. i think that it is is really interesting yeah, it's it's interesting to see, you know, in the beer world, they're spoken about, but it's still not the sexy ingredient. <laughs> but when it comes to wine and, and mead, it's it's all about the, you know, the sugar source or the terroir of where the honey comes from or where the, the grapes are grown. Uh -huh. And it's not often spoken about the magic of the yeast because it, it kind of takes away from some of that romance, right? If you say this <laughs> yeah. lab grown ingredients, what's contributing half mm -hmm. of the flavor you're tasting, you know, it's, it, it takes away a little bit from the story of yeah. the people that were out in the field actually cultivating these products. <laughs> I haven't thought of it was funny. It takes away the romance. Um, <laughs> it is, it's definitely, it's true. I mean, especially with honey, whenever I go and spend, I mean, what's, I think I've spent at max, it was a very, you know, nice honey, but it was like eight, bucks a pound and I had bought maybe six pounds of it or something mm -hmm. at that point I, there's a lot of me that wants to willpower or wants to will that the honey was the thing that made it the best it could be when in reality yeast of course could be attributing more than yeah depending on what strain yeah, yeah. what temperature you ferment at or what nutrients you use yeah so that leads me into my next question, kind of about yeast. Of course, every day, everything today is going to be about yeast. But um, what is one of the biggest misconceptions you find that people have about yeast? Whenever you're educating people, um, I'm sure you get lots of questions and common questions. What are some misconceptions you hear? Uh, you know, like, like we're kind of alluding to is that the strain doesn't matter that much. Um, or probably more importantly, more specific is that you can only use a strain that's marketed for one style. Right. And we see that a lot. And I think, you know, as a company over the years and as home brewers and brewers have changed and their knowledge level has changed and the access to information's changed, uh, the way that we describe products changes too. And, you know, we've got a sweet mead yeast and it's really the only strain in our catalog that's marketed specifically for mead. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a lot of wine strains, we have a lot of beer strains, but, you know, talking to a lot of uh, mead makers, it's like, you know, this is the only mead strain you have. Why? And it's like, that's, 
you, you can use a lot of these strains for mead. Right. You know, they've just, it's just that this strain was sourced from this type of beverage or this style or mm -hmm. this region. And it doesn't mean that you can't cross those. And we were seeing more experimentation and more of that. But, you know, 25 years ago when our company started, hell, even 10 years ago, people were very uh, specific. I mean, the internet was still in its infancy compared to where it is today. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so you've just seen... You know, if you read some of the old books from, from the 90s and, and before, they're all very specific on this is how you make this style and this recipe. But we've used that as founding blocks now and realized that was just an oversimplification to get us to understand all of this existed. Mm -hmm. And now we've experimented and, and blown out of that. But, you know, there's, there's certain products and there's certain strains that have certain names that resonated really well and still remain true to what those styles are over the last 25 years. But, you know, what I see as a misconception is people coming into it thinking, well, because that's the name in the catalog, that's the only strain I can use. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely fell in that trap too. Um, I think with mead specifically, there are, there's not a grand master list of like, use this yeast with this specific style of mead. But when you first start out, there are some um, hard and fast rules that people put and say like, use this recipe specifically, don't deviate. And uh, now that I've spent more time with it, I am starting to see those uh, benefits of experimenting with other yeast. And I, to be honest, I thought it was taboo to use like a beer yeast within a uh, mead probably, or, well, I guess it's been since COVID started. Um, mm -hmm. But I just thought it was silly. I was like, why would you ever do that? Like, that doesn't make sense. But there are some really interesting things you can get from a mead when you use a beer yeast or some other kind of yeast that's not specific to that recipe. Yeah. Yeah. So let's take a step back and talk about what yeast actually is for a minute, right? Yeah. Yeast is a lot more than what's in a catalog. Again, it's, you know, it's oversimplifying a very complex thing. And, and that's, you know, when we're talking about yeast and fermentation and, and talking on podcasts like this today, where it gets difficult because, it can be as complex or as simplified as you want it to be. But when somebody doesn't understand and you start talking about genetics and uh, different types of genus and species, it, you know, it, mm -hmm. people's eyes tend to glaze over. But when you start talking about flavor, when you start talking about this strain produces a, a pear like ester and this one produces a clove like spice, that's a lot easier to grasp. Um, but when, you know, when we're looking at yeast as a category, primarily we're, we're working with Saccharomyces cerevisiae in beer, wine, spirits, mead. Um, sometimes there are different species within that, you know, in, ca in, in the case of beers or lager beers, talking about Pastorianus or some wine spirits, um, Bionis, but they're all Saccharomyces, the same genus. So genetically, when you're looking at these strains, they're all very similar in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. The names might be different. The beverages they're sourced from might be different. But at the end of the day, they're, they're very similar in the sense that they acidify the product, they produce a lot of ethanol, and a lot of the other flavor byproducts are pretty similar, right? These mm -hmm. fruity esters, sometimes these um, spicy phenolics, depending on the, the strain. So it's not surprising that you can take a beer strain that's the same genus and species as a mead strain and, and cross ferment them where it can get a little tricky. And this is where experimentation and, and some rules of thumb come into play is the substrate that you're fermenting. Um, it's a lot easier to take a beer strain that's used to fermenting complex carbohydrates and complex sugars and ferment something simple than the other way around. Mm -hmm. So if you have a yeast strain that's only used to fermenting, uh, very simple sugars like found in mead and wine and uh, hard salts or something that people talk about a lot now too. You know, that strain might not be suitable for the sugar profile of beer, which is primarily maltose, right? Which right. is two glucose. So it's, it's logical that you could take most beer strains and ferment, you know, something like mead fairly successfully where, you know, we can get into this more in, in a minute, but mm -hmm. where you start seeing the drawback there is the nutrient requirements because mm -hmm. beer fortunately is wort and malt contribute almost every nutrient yeast needs for successful fermentation. Mead 
pretty much nothing. There's micro <laughs> levels of, you know, a, a couple of things, maybe something in your water, but yeah, you know, nutrient additions in meat is, is a much bigger deal. Whereas in beer, it's not, but you know, looking at, at the different types of strains, just because they're marketed a certain way uh, doesn't mean that they might not fit another beverage or, a, you know, it might not produce something that and it, it may produce something that's very desirable and, and tasty. I, I actually know a lot of mead makers that use beer strains for award-winning meads. Yeah. Oh, and I absolutely. I've seen it. Um, I'm part of lots of social media mead places and I see it all the time. It's a common thing. I mean, Kvike is, is a beer strain in itself, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken. So all the, well, all the, the offshoots of it, cause there are a bunch of them at this point, but <laughs> that's been one that's popping up recently. People are freaking out about, um, and it's great. I love it too. Um, so I want to ask, it's not on my list of questions, but I do want to ask you, um, when you are, well, let's say that I pair a wine yeast and uh, an ale yeast of some sort in my brew. Am I going to find that I'm getting both esters theoretical esters from the yeast um or am i is one going to take over the other like how would that work yeah um one thing we like to say a lot is it depends <laughs> uh you know as as soon as as soon as we say yes to something somebody's going to disprove it or oh, give yeah. an example where it doesn't work so it, it really depends um blending yeast is very common um, it's something that we like to do. I think it's a, a great way of adding unique complexity to something without mm-hmm. finding a new yeast strain. Um, you know, most, I'd say almost all yeast strains are non-genetically modified. So they've been domesticated over hundreds of years, mm-hmm. some of them thousands of years. So there's a finite amount, but with that said, I mean, there's, there's still, you know, thousands of different strains available. So, yeah. but you know, pairing different strains can produce unique complexity. Where it gets tricky is consistency. Mm -hmm. Um, Some strains are more expressive or ferment quicker. So you might have a strain that's more expressive, but doesn't produce those metabolites and doesn't reproduce as quickly at the onset of fermentation. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not going to be the dominant, the dominant uh, strain in that culture at the end of fermentation. Uh-huh. So, you know, we do a beer called Frankenstout. Um, it's got 96 yeast strains. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty much all of them. Um, is it, are you, is it like a house blend at this point? Like, you know, it has 96 or you're not actually putting 96 in each time. You just have a house. No, we did once, um, uh, kind of as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it wasn't actually 96 cause we didn't have 96, but we did a bunch of homebrew packets and uh-huh. I wish there was, you know, more video of it. Cause it was pretty comical at these, you know, a couple hundred gallon fermenters and doing a ton of homebrew packs, mm-hmm. but, um, no, so we did a uh, full genome sequencing of a lot of our strains, mm-hmm. um, years back. And when they're actually, um, sequencing those there's 96 wells there's 96 samples that they can process at once okay so the idea was we should take those 96 we put it on one one slant and then one plate so it's not 96 that we're propping up to the same levels it's just you know a mixed culture of 96 Mm -hmm. strains um, and then growing it up from there so what you see is certain strains again become dominant as you're propagating as you're growing it right Mm -hmm. um but you know what what we see with that beer is the belgian strains tend to dominate heavily and i don't mean from um, a culture standpoint like we're not actually identifying those in that culture would be very difficult Um, so you know we're looking at flavor like how's the beer taste what strains do we think are are dominant and it tends to be the belgian strains because they're the most expressive Mm -hmm. so what we've done when we produce that beer now is we'll take that 96 and do half uh, WLP001 California ale yeast to help kind of tone it down a little bit because it was just getting, it was getting crazier and crazier and it's a big Imperial stout. You know, we wanted something that was interesting to talk about, but was still mm-hmm. drinkable and still tasted good. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but we do have a lot of uh, yeast blends. Uh, Would you say if you, if someone was looking to do a yeast blend, should they, go by the stats of the the yeast and possibly start with maybe the one that uh, let's say you're using an ale yeast and it goes up to 10 and you're trying to also use 
um, a wine yeast that gets up to 18 for whatever reason. Mm. Um, should you start with the ale yeast until you get to like maybe the um, two third sugar break and then pitch your wine yeast? Would that be beneficial in your opinion or should you just kind of hail Mary? Here we go. Yeah. So I think you're kind of talking about two different approaches here. So one, you're talking about trying to get a higher attenuation while retaining flavor of a strain Uh that maybe doesn't have that, or just strictly speaking flavor. Uh, Most flavor production occurs in the first 24-ish hours of fermentation. Hmm. So, you know, if you're trying to coax flavor out of something, adding it at that sugar break isn't necessarily ideal. Um, because most of that flavor production has already happened. So what I would suggest is using both strains, but then you can tweak the quantities of it too, right? You don't have to pitch 50, 50 of them. Uh, but I would look at the alcohol tolerance and the higher attenuation. If you were doing 50, 50 of the strain that has the higher amounts of it and just assume that's what you're going to get. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I haven't done much yeast mixing, uh, to be honest with you. So that's one thing that I, you know, as we're talking about it, I'm thinking about all the things I can do and all the video ideas I can create with it. But um, it's very fascinating to me. And uh, I wish as a new brewer, when I first started that somebody had sat me down and said, and like gave me, gave me the yeast talk and said, here you go. This is what you need (laughs) to know about, about yeast. Because, uh, finding out about it a year into brewing worked and is fine. But I think my beginning brews would have been much nicer had I just had a little information on how to use them appropriately and like what to expect. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, you know, we, you know, we were founded by Chris White, um, who co-wrote the the book yeast, a practical guide to fermentation, which is, uh, kind of modeled around beer, but a lot of those principles, when you're talking about metabolism, yeast growth, flavor production, uh, is applicable to any alcoholic beverage fermentation. The conditions vary a little bit, especially when you start talking about temperature and, and sugar source and all that, but the fundamentals are there. And, you know, that book is something that uh, we still kind of hold as our Bible. And I think it's seen as the Bible in a, in a lot of circles. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, you know, we've got a lot of on-demand classes that we offer and we're continuously working on more. Uh, the one that I'm in the instructor for is called the many flavors of fermentation. Mm-hmm. And we talk about, you know, the, how yeast affect flavor, what, how attenuation affects flavor, you know, how CO2 production can affect flavor. And we recently got a comment on, you know, it was a great course, but it was, I, it was everything in the East book and oh, yeah. it was like, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that information is universal, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes sitting down and reading a, a, don't quote me on it, but say 200 page book on yeast isn't somebody's cup of tea, but right. listening to a podcast or watching a video. Oh, might yeah. be. You got to have different avenues. I mean, my, my main gig is I'm a teacher. And so I do that all the time. It's like, you know, when I'm teaching, I have to explain something four ways, four different methods to get, hopefully to everybody. So, mm-hmm. you know, you're right. Not everybody's going to sit down and read the yeast specs on something or, you know, go through <laughs> yeah. that. Cause it's just not, it's not super interesting, but they might find uh, a video um, or something more interesting. So mm-hmm. can you tell us what um, resources you guys provide with white labs um, to the public? Like what, what can we, um, if someone's interested in learning more about yeast, aside sure. from contacting you, what can they do? Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got, you know, a, a pretty extensive uh, history backlog of blog posts uh, that going into next year, you know, we've used 2020 as a great way of reorganizing how we're getting this content out. Uh, we've relied for a long time on just being face to face and, you know, and, and doing stuff like this, but, you know, teaching in-person workshops, attending conferences, you know, uh, speaking anywhere we can. And this year has put that to a halt. So what we've done is, uh, we've, we were really quick about, um, trying to get out there digitally. Uh, we've got an awesome staff, um, with us that that's great at video editing and production and, um, uh, also graphic artists and that kind of stuff. So as, as well as obviously the technical teams, like the information's there, but it's how, how do we get it to people and, and how do you make it entertaining? So, uh, we've done a lot with our YouTube channel in the last, um, nine months and, and done a lot of really cool videos that we hope to do a lot more next year. 
Um, we have the on-demand classes that we've done. Um, but, you know, I, I'm always a big fan of people picking up the phone or shooting an email. Yeah. Um, I know, you know, everybody might not feel that way, but <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier just to call somebody and hash something out over 10 minutes than it is uh, doing mm-hmm. a ton of research and then still getting um, mixed answers on, on your specific inquiry right. right and trying to get on the comment section of sometimes of a youtube video is you know it takes longer so i totally understand yeah. that so youtube is it white labs on youtube what's the youtube channel yeah i believe it's um youtube.com slash white labs inc great i'll um, put that down in the description of this too if, if anybody's awesome. Thank watching you. this and then of course your website where you can of course order yeast in and go through all of those avenues whatever you want to do with that yeah. And we did, uh, we do a monthly webcast series too. Um, you know, at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were doing a weekly, uh, mm-hmm. you know, we, again, fortunately we're set up to where we'd done a lot of virtual classes before. Um, so we were very quick to jump on that. Uh, we had a lot of content, so we started putting out different content weekly, then bi-weekly and now monthly, mm-hmm. just, it started just getting to be too much. And there was, right. uh, Busy. overwhelming amount of content out there. Yeah. So, uh, but the one that I wanted to share with you and your audience is there is, um, a webcast that we did with Billy of, uh, lost cause metery here in San Diego. Um, and, and really looked at, um, we've worked pretty closely with, uh, him and their team there on different R and D projects. And they've always been open to using our resources and allowing us to use theirs. Mm, and in this cool. case, um, uh, we did an R and D project looking at nutrient requirements um, of mead when we're looking at um, organic and inorganic nitrogen sources. So there's a, a pretty cool uh, webcast that you can check out on your YouTube yeah. channel. If you're I'll, I'll put that more. down there as well. And I'll find that and put that in the description. So all those links. So I have a question now about um, reusing yeast. Um, well, my main question is, can you reuse a yeast too many times to where, to the point that you've exhausted its, capabilities is that a possibility yeah definitely what uh what's your practice with using or reusing yeast quite honestly i reuse yeast uh not not very often i will pitch new yeast pretty much every time um mainly because i'm lazy and Mm -hmm. i i can go and get the strains that i want pretty simply um there are a few times that i've reused i've washed in or rinsed the yeast i should say Mm -hmm. and reused them but it's been um it's it's just not been a common practice of mine. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the same, you know, I'm, I'm on your side with that. Uh, as somebody that sells yeast for a living, it comes across as a little biased, but yeah. there's a lot that can go wrong reusing yeast. And mm-hmm. I value my time. Sometimes I'm more, I do more than a couple bucks. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm spending a lot of time, you know, making something and I know it has to sit there and ferment for a lot of time. Mm -hmm. If I knew that I didn't spend the eight bucks on a a new pack of yeast and I could have, and I waited a month and spent the money on honey and all that, it's Mm -hmm. a little disappointing. Uh, But with that said, you can very well reuse yeast, but it's very difficult to do consistently successfully at home. Mm -hmm. Um, The, you know, especially with mead, the environment's pretty harsh Uh, It can be a fairly acidic environment. It's very high um, ethanol stress. So there's a lot of alcohol present, which yeasts don't like to store in for long periods of time. It's very difficult to collect and store um, in a sanitary way. With that said, you know, I think people see success with it because they're probably pitching more yeast than they did the first time. So they Mm -hmm. see it kick off quicker. Um, you know, maybe they'll do a starter to re revitalize the culture, which is um, suggestible if you're going to hold on mm-hmm. to something. But when we're talking to, you know, pro producers, even on the beer side where it's not as stressful for the yeast, we're really only suggesting that people store it for seven days. Yeah. And for a home brewer, it's not very likely that you're storing something for seven days. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that doesn't mean just pulling it from your fermenter, putting it in a, you know, a a ball lock jar and then putting in your fridge for seven days. It means once fermentation is complete, you're pulling that and storing it for seven days. Mm -hmm. And from a home perspective, that's really difficult to monitor and keep up on with life being as it is. And yeah, 
being a hobby and not a professional job because it's very difficult for professionals to do it. So on the home scale, it's even more difficult. And and some of the risks you're looking at is, is primarily dead yeast, right? Mm-hmm. Um, not only is that maybe going to stall your fermentation and you're not going to finish out as you want, but you know, it all comes back to flavor again. Like mm-hmm. maybe the, the beer or the, the mead might not have the same um, yeast expression as you did in that first batch. And maybe that's okay. But you know, if you have a lot of um, fusel alcohols, which I know you're curious about, yeah. um, which are these higher alcohols that come across as hot, right? And solventy, mm-hmm. that's not going to be um, super desirable. And it could have likely been avoided using a fresh culture of yeast, whether that Absolutely. means something that you propagate or, or harvest, but or, or purchase, um, but having it something that's stored and then revitalized isn't likely to achieve the same quality sorry um so i lost my train of thought um does talking about the reusing of yeast and we'll come back to fusels because i have a question about that but my question is if you're reusing yeast are should you be or is autolysis going to be something that you should really be concerned about um 100 percent. i mean yep. i i can see that being a big issue like yeah dead yeast yeah i mean it's just again it it comes back to flavor and performance like uh-huh. a bunch of dead yeast and you know yeast that's essentially spilt its guts into your product yeah uh, it doesn't taste very good and it's not going to perform very well you know even if your yeast isn't italicized and sliced open um it can still look intact under a microscope, but a lot of it has to do with the reserves, the carbohydrate reserves and the nutrient reserves of that yeast. Mm -hmm. When it's coming out of a fermentation, it's depleted a lot of those reserves. So reusing it, you know, it might look okay under a microscope or it might stain and show that it's living, but it might be at the end of its life cycle. And that's difficult to tell. Yeah, that's true. It's not really, you can't ask it and say, Hey, are you good? (laughs) Yeah. um, Especially, you know, especially at home, like, you know, there are ways in a lab of looking at that, but it's very cumbersome and it's a lot more work than the couple bucks to buy a new pack. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I'm actually running a test talking about autolysis or autolysis. I don't know how you actually say it. So one of my things I love doing on my channel, of course, is that yeast shootout, but then I like doing these AB, mead mythbusters test and so i'm i'm taking these two meads right here and they're fermenting this exact same way same ingredients same temperature all that information but i'm going to leave one to age on the yeast for a year mm-hmm. and then one to age not on the yeast of course so cool. i'm curious to see the end result of that because obviously there's going to be some change I, I anticipate there being a big difference um so i'm excited to to hear that yeah. Yeah. And you might even see, you know, a difference in color at the end of it. Um, you know, that yeast might help prevent oxidation, but it, it might also uh, just in- increase a lot of um, negative aspects to the mead. Mm-hmm. You know, it's going to be a lot of yeast would be my, my take on what that's going to turn out to be. So you're going to have a much more of a flavor impact of that meaty kind of dead leaves yeah. uh, character from, um, italicized yeast but you know there are beverages like champagne where you know yeast the aging on the leaves and having that slightly italicized flavor is a positive Mm -hmm. and for a long time and i'm talking about like you know true authentic champagne not the you know um champagne method found on your 499 bottles <laughs> yeah. which you know are, are great for mimosas and all that but you're not going to get the, the the true character and process of authentic champagne but what they're doing is they're actually uh adding a little bit of the lees a little bit of the yeast back into the bottle mm-hmm. uh, to add some of that almost nutty flavor hmm. and for a long time trying real champagne i said why does this taste like beer it's like it tastes like malt it tastes like malt and it's like it's obvious you know now that it wasn't malt, it was actually yeast character that was being introduced yeah. into huh. the champagne where you're seeing that in other beverages too. So there's probably, you know, while I think 
your experiment probably has a lot of yeast in there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to add a lot of flavor. You know, there are a lot of meads that are aged on lees too. So mm -hmm. there could be a lot of positives to that as well. Yeah. And it's a, well, for me, it's a big theory. I haven't really put it to the test ever. And so it's a, it's just an experimentation on my end and it's going to take a long time. It's going to take a year, but it's still going to be something I find interesting. So, uh, and I, I don't think a lot of people think about aging on the yeast and the, the side effects of it. Um, you just see, at least when you look at mead recipes, wine recipes, whatever, there's no mention of racking specifically off of the yeast from what mm -hmm. I notice. Um, they don't, well, they don't specify why you're doing it. They just say rack off of it. And I think that's because it does get into the, the weeds of like a pretty tough and weird process to explain. So I would say that like me doing this test is just a, a fun way for me to experiment with it at this point. Yeah, it's a lot of commitment, but you've got a lot of mead behind you. So. Oh yeah, I got I've, I've got too many projects going on. It's it's totally fine. I can make it work. Um, so now I want to go into the fusels world. So my understanding of fusels is is that they are off flavored alcohols created from stressed yeast and fermentation, and that there is a not a grandmaster list somewhere, but there is a a somewhat defined list of common fusels. Can you explain fusels in a probably more mature way than I just did? <laughs> sure. Um, so, you know, when you're looking at different alcohols, um, a major aspect of the primary source is going to be different types of acids, right? Uh -huh. So, you know, ethanol is the most abundant produced type of alcohol, Fusils are generally categorized as everything else. Mm -hmm. So fusils are not necessarily a negative unless they're in high enough quantities to um, overtly detect and perceive them. Yeah. Then they are kind of, again, harsh and um, negative in the sense that they, they don't taste good to most people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, the formation of them is going to vary a lot dependent on strain and yeast strain and the conditions of what they're used in. Mm -hmm. So uh, a yeast that's stressed is likely to produce more fusels um, because it's not directing a lot of the energy to um, ethanol acid haldehyde production, which goes to ethanol. Mm -hmm. So okay. it kind of veers off to a different pathway and you're looking at uh, different acids and esters, which are going to, um, you know, form a lot of those fusel alcohols. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So are there, is there any common link between a, let's say a fermentation that's too hot in yeast, are they going to put off a consistent quote fusel um, or is it really just dependent on the yeast and like, is there any consistency to that? Yeah. They'll consistently produce higher quantities of fusels, mm -hmm. but I've never seen any research done on if it produces a specific fusel okay. to what quantity we in, we have an analytical lab where we offer um, testing for, you know, home brewers or commercial producers. Mm -hmm. And we do test for, I want to say four or five fusel alcohols. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it is something that we'll look at, but very broadly, you know, we're not saying like, is there one propanol in this and to what level? Uh -huh. We'll kind of look at it and say, okay, generally the fusel alcohols of this product are above threshold. So mm -hmm. there's likely that something happened with yeast health or temperature to cause that. Okay. But we're not, spe we're not specifying specific fusels like we are with ethanol. Yeah. Well, and I, I've just seen you know, it was probably some, some, um, Google, I, Googling I did at some point that somebody was like, these are the fusels. And I think that that could be an opinion, but, um, I, I've heard about fusels and I think I've definitely experienced them in my brain, sure. um, time, but I, I didn't know if they were specific. So I, I've always wondered about that. Um, and I've never put it to the test. So, yeah, we've, yeah, kind of just look at it as a category. Um, again, we talk about them being undesirable, because when we know they're there, they don't taste good, but mm -hmm. they're always there. They're usually just in levels below threshold. Mm -hmm. um, and to that point, they, they can add 
um, subtle positives to a beverage, but you're not really looking at manipulating them the way you would at um, esters and, and fruity compounds from yeast. Okay. That makes sense. And um, I think in some ways that's encur- should be encouraging to people that you're going to have fusels in your brew regardless. And that's just because they're a part of the brewing process. Like I said, though, you don't want them to be, um, you don't want to taste it. Yeah. yeah. You don't really want to taste them, but it's good to know that they're there. It's not like, I guess if, if it's perceivable, that's where you run into issues. Yeah. If you're having a fusel issue and you have, and you're adding proper nutrients, I would look at fermentation temperature. Lowering so, your fermentation temperature is likely going to help, um, uh, you know, lower the production of fusel alcohols. Do you feel that fusels will age out of a brew over time? Definitely not. Nope. Okay. Have you, um, yeah, that's interesting. I've always, I've never known that either. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's so there's, you know, there's things that are going to stay. Um, your esters are going to stay. Um, your alcohols are going to stay. Your, your phenols are going to stay diacetyl, you know, that butter popcorn, um, uh, flavored compound isn't going to go anywhere. Um, whereas the precursor alpha acetolactate will convert to that or hopefully get reabsorbed mm-hmm. um, in your fermentation. Uh, but something like SO2 and different sulfur compounds can dissipate. So, okay. you know, that's, you know, and that's, that's spoken about a lot in, in mead and winemaking mm-hmm. where um, it can be a, a positive for preservation, but when it gets to really high levels, but you know, you also poured a glass and man, this smells like rotten eggs or burnt <laughs> matches and you yeah. swirl it for a couple minutes, let it warm up and it dissipates. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the, probably the most common one I, I hear about is that, you know, rotten egg, sulfury smell. Um, there are some other ones I've heard somebody mention like rubber, like the, um, like a rubbery kind of smell before. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know the specifics of, of them, but I definitely have been cognizant of their existence and just trying to uh, understand them more. It's yeah, a- I would, my suggestion, uh, and it depends on how in the weeds you are with this uh, as a hobby, mm-hmm. is to just at the end of the day, does it taste good or do you not like it? And then try to figure out ways to manipulate it to achieve the desired result. Because it's really easy to get nitpicky about all of these specific compounds, but truth be told, it's very hard to consistently manipulate them on a small scale without mm-hmm. a lot of really expensive equipment. So looking at a much broader approach on does it taste good and can it replicate this uh-huh. is you're going to sleep a lot better at night than, <laughs> you know, just thinking about one specific fusel, higher alcohol and, and how to, how to get it lower or, mm-hmm. you know, where it came from. Um, Cause the odds are that you're probably misdiagnosing, misassessing what you're even tasting anyways, mm-hmm. unless you have, you know, gas chromatography. <laughs> it, it, you know, the nose is a great tool and can be very useful, but, just there's good chances that you're you're not correct in what you're perceiving. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there are a lot of new brewers that are smelling these things, and, and not to say that they aren't smelling true things, but yeah, it, I I to this day I probably miss a lot of things as I'm sniffing around and trying to understand my own brewing problems. So um, yeah, it just it takes time to get used to those things. Yeah, it does. Yeah, and and look at again the consistency of your profile and what your equipment and what your ingredients produce. Mm-hmm. I remember one of the first batches I ever did. Um, you know, it's just a, a house full of college age dudes. So you're just like, let's make beer. Yeah. This is cool. And we had it fermenting in a big bucket in the kitchen and open the lid, just completely open and stick my head in, like just take a big whiff. And I just was like, well, something's not right with that. And it took us like, you know, we weren't, we weren't, I should say we obviously were dumb kids, but we weren't unintelligent. Yeah. And it took a couple of minutes to figure, Oh, that's probably a bunch of CO2. I just stuck my head <laughs> yeah. into and took like a big, I could have passed out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I never forgot it and I never did it again. So yeah, you, you uh, burn some <laughs> of your nostrils through there. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, um, I, that's funny. I, I'm looking, I, one of my meads I like to make and I'm trying to perfect is a peppermint mead. And I, oh, I just throw a lot of candy canes into a pot and then a lot of honey and do a bunch of stuff. But I did that the other day. I wanted to smell it and I opened it up and <laughs> I was blasted and I was like, oh yeah, okay. This is not a great time to try and smell this. It's not going to not going to be um, as nice as what I want. So, yeah. 
So my last question I want to ask you, and um, you can explain at whatever level you want to. I want to ask you about the process um, of brewing. Like how does, how does, even in simple terms, how does the sugar break into alcohol? Can you explain that? And I'm asking a lot for myself because I'm a very um, uh, audio visual person. So I think it'll help me and no doubt somebody else. Yeah. So let me even take a step further back and talk about our process and how we grow yeast. Okay. Uh, because it's something that's very easy to do. I mean, it's similar to brewing. It's very easy to do, but very difficult to do well. Mm -hmm. Um I, I'm a musician, so I, I equate it to playing bass a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, playing bass to a very rudimentary level, super easy, but mm -hmm. being a, a true bassist and is very difficult. Um, so, you know, yeast has been, as I mentioned earlier, domesticated over hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. And what I mean, what happened during that time is, it was passed from brewer to brewer, from village to village, from house to house. I mean, most mm -hmm. brewing at this time was done. It was very agriculture based. It's, you know, it's the reason we have mead and beer and different mm -hmm. types of wine and spirits. It's because it was what was available. And it was the yeast strains that were used were what was naturally occurring in those environments too. Uh, primarily found on fruit, which is convenient, uh, right. different types of grain. And after using it over and over again, the brewer would select different pieces of equipment or different processes or utilize different times of year with different temperatures, uh, not knowing that they were encouraging the growth of certain organisms over others. Hmm. So it wasn't until the mid to late 1800s um, at the Carlsberg lab in Copenhagen, uh, which is kind of a fun tie in why we have a lab there today mm -hmm. that they were able to isolate uh, the first pure uh, yeast culture. So they looked under a microscope and they, you see lots of bacteria, wild yeast, and, and their process was probably fairly clean. They said, this is the organism we want. So they, you know, grabbed that and were able to propagate that. When I say propagate, I just mean replicate it and grow it. Mm -hmm. So feeding yeast, uh, oxygen and nutrients, it's going to be happy. It's going to replicate. It's going to take those in. It's going to build the cell wall. It's going to mm -hmm. bud and create a lot more yeast, which we all see in our fermentations, right? You pitch, right say 40 mils of our yeast and you end up with, you know, four or five times that mm -hmm. um, biomass at the end of fermentation. And so, you know, at that point, then people started banking the yeast and, and trying to manage these cultures a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Jump up to 1995, um, you know, it was still being done. It was mostly done by a lot of national labs, a lot of colleges, um, and a lot of large regional breweries. And we've since been able to build up our yeast bank, uh, you know, which is literally and not so literally <laughs> uh, a, a big 80 degree, negative 80 degree freezer, cryogenic freeze of Ooh. yeast. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's got um, five to 700 different strains frozen. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah. And there's a lot of cool stuff that I don't even know what's in there. There's a lot of um, stuff that seems you know, archaic. You like go in there and find <laughs> some crazy yeah. stuff. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's kind of cool and it's all iced over and you know, all, that, <laughs> all the, the cold air starts pouring out when you open the door and all that. It's, it's exactly how you visualize, but it's awesome. uh, kind of like, you know, dry ice and all yeah. that. Which is, <laughs> uh, and so then, you know, now we take that small amount and we, propagate or grow it up in a very controlled environment. So we mm -hmm. know how much oxygen to add. We know when we know what type of nutrients it needs and we know how to keep it sterile so that there's not other organisms that get in there. And that's the key mm -hmm. is, you know, it's, it's very, again, it's very easy to do anybody that's made a yeast starter at home, mm -hmm. uh, which is encouraged. It's an awesome, fun thing to do. Um, understands that you take a little bit of yeast, give it the environment that it wants and you get more yeast, mm -hmm. but to do that, to a large scale with high purity is very difficult. Mm -hmm. So then the brewer has yeast that's ready to go. They've mm -hmm. got yeast that's in a pitchable quantity, meaning there's enough yeast to ferment whatever they're trying to ferment. You know, mm -hmm. it's, they know, we know what volume or we, there's standardized volumes, which is why you've got one gallon and, you know, probably some five gallon carboys as well. Right. Yeah. Uh, so fortunately that's standardized and you kind of, you know, most beers and most meads start, 
at standard ranges. You can adjust the yeast pitch from the pitch rate from there. But so then you're going to add your yeast and what the yeast is going to do is going to take any nutrient or any uh, nutrients, primarily oxygen that's available and start adapting to the environment. So it's going to, it, what it wants to do is um, overtake that environment so that no other organisms can get a foothold in there. Right. So they're going to see any oxygen and, and nutrients and sugars and say, this is all mine. So in order to do that, there needs to be more of me. So I'm going to replicate so we can dominate this environment. And what that does is creates, creates a very, uh, stable product for us to consume mm -hmm. because if it was a very slow fermentation and you added just a little bit of yeast, it might finish out over months, over years, mm -hmm. but the odds are there's going to be something else that lands in there too, uh, that begins replicating. And that might be a pathogen or something that we don't want in our, in our food or beverages. So the yeast is taking that oxygen building up its cell wall, budding um, in order to do that. It's depleting the, reserve carbohydrates that we as a yeast lab gave it. So uh -huh. while we're growing it up, we're allowing these, these cells to build up their carbohydrates in the cell because they know they're going to become, there's, there's going to come a time where they're going to want to replicate and, and almost starve themselves. Mm -hmm. So they're going to deplete those internal carbohydrates to build up the cell wall and bud, which is going to give you more of it. And then it's going to begin uh, actively fermenting. So taking those sugars and, converting them to ethanol, CO2, a different flavor. Okay. And towards the end of fermentation, it's going to start um, keeping like storing those reserves again so that it's, it's ready for storage or reuse. Interesting. Okay. I, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I, I found it really fascinating. I didn't thought about, um, you know, when yeast was basically handed between let's say towns at that point mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, that's pretty fascinating too. Uh, the whole process is, is incredible to me. And uh, I would love to, if I can ever make it out to California, if COVID ever ends, I would love to come through and, and see you guys' operation. Cause I think that's, um, it'd be super cool. As I yeah, do more brewing, as I do more brewing, I find that it's like, it's a, uh, the science guy in me starts popping out and I didn't yeah. expect that. I thought I was just going to start brewing in like, like, Oh, cool booze, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I'm making good stuff, but it's, it's very, very cool. And I'm sure there are people listening to this who might also have that same sort of uh, passion um, about it. Yeah. You start, uh, you know, looking at different aspects of your other aspects of your personal life um, through different ones too. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. we are all microbiologists and, you know, there's a, a lot that ties into it, whether you like cooking or baking. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the last story I'll leave you with, um, which I, I like telling often is, you know, what, what I specifically do at White Labs and what we do as a company can be um, a little difficult for people to understand because it's the next level geeky of, you know, uh -huh. these products. Like most people understand what they are. So you drink for a living? Sure. Like whatever, you know, I like saying taste, but sure. Yeah. Drinking's fun. <laughs> um, and you know, but when it comes to the, the yeast side of it, it's a little more unknown, but there are, these concepts are, are not new to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They've just haven't really seen it, you know, beer specifically or mead specifically, uh, it through that lens. And so the story that I, I'll leave us with is, I had family come through and do a tour of our facility a couple of years ago. I'd been with white labs for a couple, couple of years. Um, I'd been in the industry for, you know, years beyond that. And it, it was a 45 minute tour. I gave everybody the facility and it was my mom who's I've, again, I've talked to for years about what I do and mm -hmm. I've brewed with her and, and she gets to the end of the tour and she just shouts friendship bread. And if you know my mom, it'd be a pretty funny visualization, but she says friendship bread. And I'm like, mom, what the hell are you talking about? Friendship <laughs> bread. I was just telling you all about this yeast. And she goes, it's when your neighbor's proofing bread and they rip off a little bit and they bring it to you. And then you have a starter that you can start baking bread. And I was just like, it's exactly friendship <laughs> bread. <laughs> That's yeah, exactly get it now. It all do. makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, I just, it was, uh, it's, it, so eye-opening because it's such layman's terms uh -huh. to think that she's understood what I've done this whole time, but through, you know, a very, something that might be handwritten in a cookbook that her mom gave her. Yeah. 
and I think it's a concept that everybody has seen in some form or fashion. Um, it's just that in depth uh, understanding that gets to be kind of tough. And I don't think it, every, I don't think as a brewer, you have to know the crazy in depth um, understandings of like what exactly happens, what, specifically turns into alcohol and that stuff but you do need to know that your yeast have requirements your yeast um have needs and that ultimately um you are kind of the master of helping those yeast thrive and uh, i think like what you said earlier just about keeping a sterile environment feeding them well um th that's the best way to have a clean fermentation and have a good product and for anybody listening like if you are wanting to make a a nice product make sure you are putting a lot of emphasis on your ingredients but also your yeast ultimately well said so well, thank you so much for your time eric is there anything you would like to promote with white labs or yourself or anything like that no just uh you know we love having these conversations so you know hit us up on social media hit us up on youtube uh you can email us like we we like talking about this stuff and, and talking to other fermentation geeks alike so <laughs> let's keep yeah. the conversation going and you know let us know what you're interested in and and how we can best aid what you guys all do absolutely well i'll make sure to blog down below if you want to check out white labs and all of their things and if you want to contact eric i'll try and and put his email or something so if you want to say hey appreciate <laughs> appreciate it and all those things but uh thank you guys for listening this has been fun eric thank you for coming on and, and spending your time i know you could be doing a million things right now before the end of the year but here you are <laughs> i'm glad we got to squeeze it in yeah it's, it's exciting man well thank you for your time and um i would love to do this again i'm sure i'll have more questions i i tend to have too many questions at this point so anytime all right man appreciate your time cheers. thank you cheers